So uh, welcome um, to our COP28 roundtable discussion. Uh, joining us today is uh, Dr. Chas Baker, Dr. B.B. Cow, and joining us online is um, Dr. Claire Evans. So thank you for joining us today. Um, now, you're all attending COP28, and uh, in front of us there are three questions relating to COP. Um, starting with you, Chelsea, if you'd like to pick a question we will, uh, and read it out, we'll, um, we'll see what your answers are. Okay. So the question is, what is your field of research and how does it relate to COP28? So I'll go first. Um, so my area of research is around ocean carbon storage and in particular um, how biological processes in the ocean um, lead to ocean carbon storage. This is a natural cycle in the ocean that happens. And in particular, I'm interested uh, in deep ocean carbon storage. Um, so that's carbon that's stored on what we call climate relevant time scales. So that's usually looking at uh, 100 years uh, and beyond. Um, the ocean is um, the sort of largest active carbon sink and so it's being explored um, as a potential uh, climate mitigation solution. So um, this is where people are looking at trying to use the ocean to uh, store carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, on long time scales in the ocean and those, so that's one of the things that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and climate mitigation solutions uh, are sort of a or oh, will be at COP28, if mm -hmm. you like. It will be one of the issues that's being uh, sort of raising awareness around the science that's needed and uh, some of the questions that we need to address to sort of see how effective they could be. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I, I know that you recently published a paper um, talking around the leaky ocean. Um, are there any myths or is there any, any kind of areas that you'd like to expand on that one? So, um, yeah, so I published a, uh, a modelling study. So this is using uh, ocean uh, models. So it's a sort of it's like a virtual test tube where you can try diff different scenarios and see um, what the effects are. Um, so this study was looking at um, carbon storage in the deep ocean um, and there is this statement that's often uh, been used a long time both in the scientific community and taken beyond that that once carbon uh, reaches below a thousand meters it will stay there for at least a thousand years if not longer um, and we wanted to test whether that was the case um, and so we uh, used uh, an ocean model we tracked the physical flow uh, of carbon in the ocean um, to determine, uh, so over a hundred year time scale, how much of it would actually stay there. And so, uh, as an example, one of the things that we found, this was for the North Atlantic, that on average, uh, at a thousand metres, only 66% would stay uh, sequestered for a hundred years. Um, however, we have to caveat this with that it's one model study. Uh, we've only looked in the North Atlantic, so we haven't looked globally. And there's a few other nuances around it as well. Um, but this is one of the things that when uh, these climate mitigation solutions and ocean-based carbon dioxide removal approaches are thinking about long-term carbon sequestration, um, we have to factor in that it's not the same everywhere throughout the ocean. You have to think about where you're doing these approaches um, and what depth the mm. carbon that you're trying to store will get to. Mm. So still lots of work to be done and lots of research to be undertaken. Yes, definitely. And we need to see um, if we uh, test these different approaches uh, in different model situation, uh, simulations and different setups. Um, what is the permanence? What are the time scales? Uh, how long does it stay sequestered for? So there's lots of questions around that to be explored. Thanks, Chelsea. Uh, so same question to you then, Carl. Yeah, sure. So I guess I largely study the sort of natural processes by which carbon enters the deep ocean from, via plankton. So we call this the biological pump, as in all of the different things that happen in the upper ocean that sort of send carbon down mm. in the form of particles or otherwise. And then it, that's where it's stored for different amounts of time, <laughs> depending who you ask. <laughs> uh, so I guess this has been a really difficult process to study, and it depends on a whole lot of different factors, um, but we're trying to get a better handle on that by combining different kinds of observations and, and knowledge through that. So that, I guess that's a bit of a description. And I'm also aware that you've also had a, a paper recently published um, focusing on the changing colour of the ocean. Yes. So actually that's related to this question of carbon storage because we used a sort of 20 year time series of satellite data which covers this, the whole global surface ocean and we were able to diagnose a change in the color over the time of the water of the light leaving the, the water 
And what that tells us is that the plankton community is changing. And that matters because different types of plankton form different kinds of particles and they sink differently. <laughs> and so when you see changes in the ecosystem and the mm -hmm. plankton community, then that's going to have implications for how much carbon the ocean can store. Right. So, you, you can you so how is it changing? How's the, how are the plankton changing? So that's a good question. Yeah. We're looking into that now. Uh, it's, it's very complicated to sort of try to relate complex color changes mm -hmm. to something simple about um, the plankton community, but that's uh, that's where I'm hoping the research will go next. And is acidification, is that, is, is that an influence? So it could be related to acidification, it could be related to temperature change. I think what's most likely happening is that um, over time the ocean is becoming more stratified, mm. which means that it's more difficult for nutrients to get from the sort of deep where they're rich to the, to the surface where there's light. And right. you need the combination of light and nutrients for mm. things to grow. And so if we see changes in the stratification, then that's going to mean that we have difference in, differences in nutrients, and that's going to mean that the plankton community is going to change as a result. Thanks for explaining. I'm not a science but scientist. So. <laughs> um, and uh, final question to, uh, same question actually to, to Claire, please, online. Thanks. Yeah, so like my colleagues, uh, Chelsea and Kale, really it's all about carbon. That's what we're interested in when we're thinking about how the ocean um, plays into our climate or helps regulate our climate. But unlike uh, Kale and Chelsea, I tend to go a bit further more towards the land and even onto the land at times. So what I'm really interested in is carbon cycling from up in river catchments out to the deep ocean. And specifically, the research questions that I'm really looking at is how different components of the marine system actually sequester or lock up, if you like, so store away this carbon keeping it out of the atmosphere. So literally looking at a whole range of different factors, things like how land use change might impact on the ocean's ability to store carbon, how um, coastal vegetative ecosystems, so we're thinking here about salt marshes and seagrass and mangroves and things like that, how they lock away carbon into their sediments, and then even out into the deep ocean as well, looking at how microbes are playing a role in this process too. And so um, it's so, so important, really, when you think about the fact that we can manage some of these systems or processes by how we use our environment or how we manage our environment. And so what my research is really interested in is looking at how we can then harness this knowledge to potentially use the ocean to, to increase or protect the carbon that's stored within it. And really, um, this can... Um, go alongside um, all the other processes, of course, that we have to implement, which is so, so important in mitigating our, our carbon emissions. Any questions for Claire on that one? So, Claire, I was curious, do you have a sense of the sort of amount of overall carbon that can be stored by these, uh, these systems? So um, we're working on that in the, at the moment. And so there are figures out there. And importantly, what we're trying to get to is what contribution they could make to offsetting sort of carbon emissions. And um, there are various figures out there, but there's an estimate that these kind of nature based contributions, if you like. So that is harnessing what the natural environment can already do could make up something like about 20 percent of the contribution of the ocean's uh, sort of potential solutions, if you like, to offset our emissions. So, so in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much. It works out to something like 1% of total emissions. But when you consider how big that number is to start with, then even though 1% sounds small, it's really, really important. And also the other good thing about managing our marine environment in this way is it doesn't just give us the benefits of sort of trapping and keeping that carbon out of our atmosphere, but also it um, provides lots of other ecosystem services. And generally speaking, they support biodiversity as well. And the biodiversity and the climate crisis are so intertwined. So it's really anything that we can do to tackle both together is a win-win. 20% sounds good. I'll take no. that. I'd be no. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on to the next question and see you up to that. Sure. So this question reads, what challenges do your fields of research need to overcome? So I guess I'll take that first. Please, yeah. 
I guess for me, there are two things that come immediately to mind. One is, you know, we're looking at very long-term changes in very complicated systems, which are also very difficult to observe just because they're very far away from, from land. And so we are going to always need to have these sort of large observational programs sustained over time, because otherwise we have no way of monitoring things. We can make guesses, but we have no way of verifying that you know, the guesses we have are mm. actually correct. So it will always be a challenge and we'll always need a substantial amount of funding to maintain these sustained observations, but it's absolutely essential for our ability to understand you know, these changes over time. And, and so that's one piece. Um, I think the other thing is you know, we're always thinking about new technologies and new ways of measuring things and um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a great thing. But at the same time, you know, we have all of these older historical measurements of different types and we have places we've gone to see and made some measurements and of one kind and then things change. And um, it's, it's not easy to try to sort of stitch together or merge or make sense of these kind of complicated multiple different types of, of data sets, especially when the processes or ecosystems we're interested in are very complicated and hard to understand even if you did have a perfect mm. data set. Mm. And so, you know, thankfully now there's a lot of really nice work happening. Everybody knows about the kind of machine learning, artificial intelligence yeah. revolution, but, you know, in even more sort of foundational statistics, there's a lot of really nice work that's being done to try to figure out better ways to merge these different types of data. But I think that's going to be a big forefront and a big challenge is to try to use the different kinds of data that we have and will continue to have, but then also keep making these measurements and then try to make sense of it all together. It's, it's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. And, and is that a challenge as well? Is it like global collaboration? You know, you work, you've played nicely together? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, there are all these questions of trying to get different people's data sets together and compiled. Mm. And thankfully, it's much easier now with the sort of open source principles mm. that are common to, to do that. But it hasn't been always easy. And mm. you know, it's getting much better, which yeah. is great. Um, but it's, you know, it, we're talking about a really big global problem. And so yeah. we need these kind of big solutions that involve lots of different researchers from all over the world and, and their data. Great. Well, let's move around the table. Same question as Chelsea. So actually, I'm going to talk about a similar thing, but from a slightly different perspective. Um, so when we're thinking about these ocean based carbon dioxide solutions, um, before you go to uh, make a perturbation in the ocean, so you try and store more carbon, you really need to know what your baseline is and without, without good ocean observing systems that allow us to characterize what the state of play is now. So then we can know, OK, we've um, tried to do something into the ocean to store more carbon, we can then try and figure out whether we've had a net positive or a net negative effect. So the ocean observing is really important from that perspective and also um, so that we can determine whether we've had any impacts on the ecosystem and the environmental conditions as well. So um, yeah, we, the infrastructure for ocean observing is, is really uh, important. And the other thing that picks up on one of your points, Kale, is that um, actually the ocean is already changing as well. So trying to figure out these ecosystem interactions and how it relates to carbon storage and how that might then interact mm. if you deploy these different ocean based carbon dioxide removal approaches. You've got lots of different factors changing all at once. And so without uh, robust observations, it's really difficult for us as scientists to figure out what's driving what, what's changing and how that will continue to change in the future. Yeah. And is that change? Is that speeding up that change? Uh, it very much depends what uh, sort of, I guess, variable in the mm. ocean that you're um, looking at. So, you know, we often think about the common ones like temperature and acidification. Um, and again, depending on where you are in the ocean, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to uh, sort of quantify that in a, in a, in a well, it's easy to quantify, but it's hard to give an overall picture in a basic way. Yeah. Um, but I think that, um, you know, we, we need these observations and we need to have a good assessment of where we're at now before we start making these sort of extra changes uh, into the ocean to try and store more carbon. Just to jump in on that really quick, um, in terms of whether anything is accelerating, mm. I think we do have a good sense that starting this year and over the next several years, we're going to see um, a faster increase in global temperature change than we've seen in recent decades. because. 
as maybe you've read on the news, but, you know, El Nino has switched phases, and that's mm-hmm. going to largely mean that we see a, a big difference in the overall warming pattern, and therefore we're going to see a, a bigger increase in warming. So I think it's, it's predicted that there's a more than 50% chance right now that we're going to exceed one and a half degrees warming mm-hmm. for at least one year in the upcoming next few years. And I think that's going to happen. But you know, again, we're really, when we talk about climate change, we're thinking about these sort of slower, multi-decadal type changes. And so acceleration is a, is a tricky thing since it's only been happening for, you know, hasn't been happening for that long anyway. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Claire, um, I guess the same question to yourself, please. Okay, so like my colleagues say, um, the ocean is going to be so, so important in helping us to mitigate climate change, both through the sort of natural processes that it does, but also our management of the ocean um, to enhance the sequestration or, or taking up of this carbon that we don't want in our atmosphere. And what we need to really understand that is even in coastal systems is far more scientific evidence to actually understand how we can maximise those services and how effective they really are. And of course, when we're thinking about management of the ocean, um, we can't take the people out of the scenario, if you like. So, so actually, people become an integral part of that equation. So it's not just understanding the biogeochemistry, so how elements are cycling, but it's understanding how that can occur within um, the, the area in which people are living their lives. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is um, get more investment for the restoration or conservation of uh, the ecosystems that exist in our our coastal systems. Now, we know that these are some of the most threatened ecosystems in the world, and yet they're some of the best at quickly binding up carbon and storing it away, and yet they're being destroyed. So we really need to to, you know, harness this sort of uh, people power, if you like, and understand why is that happening and how we can direct more resourcing into the restoration of these habitats. Now, one of the ways we can do that potentially is through private finance, if you like, through sort of offsetting schemes um, to actually pay to have these ecosystems restored because we know that then they will bind so much carbon. Now, whilst this can seem a little distasteful, you know, we are going to need more money channeled into this uh, mechanism. And so that's something that's that's quite key in terms of looking at, well, how do we actually make this financially work? Can it work on a practical level? And also another very important um, part of the whole puzzle, if you like, is where carbon tends to be stored quickly or bound up quickly and then taking out the atmosphere is in um, more tropical environments, if you like. And yet it's these environments that tend to have the lower GDP and they're less, you know, they're more uh, in the sort of lower development brackets, if you like. And so, it, you know, when if you're, if you're asking, asking people, people to change, change their, their lifestyle, lifestyle, that can cause financial hardship. So I think what we need to do um, as, a, as a mankind is, is figure out how do we protect those communities that are at the coal phase of not only the effects of climate change, but also how we can harness natural ecosystems to mitigate climate change. So I think that political question and, you know, how do we get the world to come together and join up is really, really important too. That's really interesting that you say that, Claire, because it sounds very similar to the type of questions that the sort of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal community are grappling with as well. Um, So there's lots of discussion around the need for this sort of robust and transparent uh, monitoring of any deployments, um, reporting of carbon stored and any ecosystem impacts, and then verification that this carbon has actually been stored, Um, but also that Um, A lot of possible deployments might be around sort of uh, small island states, um, those that maybe don't have the uh, same governance or or sort of lower governance structures. Um, And so they could be vulnerable to uh, sort of exploitation um, by different companies, or it could be that actually there could be some positive benefits bringing uh, jobs and sort of economic uh, input to different places. So there's a really tricky balance there between the science and the sort of solutions that we need, but making sure that 
there's a net positive for, for society, for local communities, and also for the ocean together. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know, Claire touched on that earlier when she was talking about you know, the, the, the wider ecosystems and, and biodiversity obviously being part of that as well. So. Yeah, there's lots of different factors yeah, to consider. Yeah. I think this is one of the things that's so important about the COP process is that, you know, I think my understanding is that loss and damage has become a really important sort of point in these negotiations, and I think these loss and damage funds are going to be what's you know a big a big focus and i think that's that's what can help with this kind of issue right yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and i guess as well cop brings together sort of a diverse range of stakeholders so you have scientists will be there um you have policy makers people working on regulations and governance from all across the globe and so it's a really good opportunity to bring together these different groups mm -hmm. who all really need to be in the same room talking to each other but it doesn't always happen as much as it should and i think it's a it's a key time um, for sort of the blue carbon approaches that Claire is talking about and yeah. the ocean-based carbon dioxide removal solutions yeah. to try and make some progress in that area. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think we're ready to move on to our final question. Um, Claire, this one well, is probably directed to you to start off with. Um, I don't know, in front of me. So, Claire, uh, what is the one thing that you'd personally like to see achieved through COP28? It's hard to pick um, just one thing, if you like, um, coming out of COP, but what I'd really like to see is a sort of more global commitment to decarbonise across governments around the, the earth. So, um, actual tangible ways to do this and more resource being put towards um, the targets we need to ensure that we um, really keep our emissions on a good trajectory towards reduction. Because even the targets we have, if you think about it, allowing a rise of sort of 1.5 degrees, which we know we're not probably going to hit now, you know, even that is terrible. And that's our kind of best case scenario. So really, I would like to see um, effort, political effort galvanized around the world to actually um, really start doing something about this. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I think you know. Bottom line is that we have to stop emitting CO two, don't we? All these mitigation um, projects and initiatives are all good, but essentially, it's, it's addressing the root cause of the problem. So, moving on to uh, Cal, same question for you. Please. Sure. Yeah. So, for me, actually, I think it's pretty simple, and it has again to do with emission reduction. Mm -hmm. If I think about what's different about this COP from recent COPs, it's that it's in the UAE. And that means that there's much more of an opportunity to get fossil fuel industries to, to have buy-in. Mm. And so I guess if I'd like to see anything achieved here, I'd like to see a much more substantial buy-in from the fossil fuel industry into specifically emission reduction. And that can take many different forms, and we'll see what happens. But um, that's, I guess, what seems to me as a unique opportunity in this yeah. COP relative mm -hmm. to others. Yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, so I would I agree with what both of my colleagues have just said, and I think this is also an interesting COP because it's the first time ever that there's going to be a global stock take. So that's an assessment to see how we're doing towards progress towards the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. um, so that's as relating to the 1.5 degree or 2 degree uh, absolute upper limit um, for sort of average global warming. Um, and so I think you know, seeing an assessment of how we're doing or how we're not doing and what we really need to do to actually get this sort of drastic emissions reduction. Because as you said, Peter, um, you know, the climate mitigation solutions can help, but they're a really small part of the puzzle. Mm. Um, I think the last stat I saw was that we need 43% uh, reduction in carbon dioxide emissions by 2030 based off the 2019 levels. Wow. And for context, I think during COVID when you know the world kind of shut down, uh, it was a 6% decrease. And that I think really gives you the scale of the problem mm. yeah. uh, that we really need to achieve. And I think Kale's right that um, if we can get the fossil fuel companies to kind of buy into that, that would be an amazing achievement. Well, I think that those stats put it into, into context, doesn't it? Yeah, it's it's kind of shocking when you think yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, thank thank you again for uh, joining us today this afternoon um, to talk about COP twenty eight. I hope we achieve what we what we kind of setting out to achieve, and and uh, I wish us all good luck. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks very much.